the storage side, you know, the thin client piece. Um, but still, you've got that dynamic that I was talking about earlier, $20 billion market cap, dollars company, and the old declining factor that the new can pick up. And so you've got that, that dynamic going on. So it's a matter of, okay, when does that flip? When do you get that? So look, it's almost like a startup. Absolutely. And in a sense, it is. Yeah, and also, not right. only in terms of the size, but in terms of feeling yeah, the yeah, passion yeah, yeah. the employees yeah. have, I feel I'm in a $65 billion business, $60 billion business, everybody's acting like And welcome back, everybody. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's kind of premier passion, flagship goes a long way. TV Look, broadcast, uh, where we go out to the events and we uh, basically extract, extract the signal from the noise. We talk to the smartest people at the best technology events and bring that information to you. I'm Jeff Kelly with wikibon.org, and I'm joined... technology specifically, or maybe he'll tell us that it is. <laughs> so we have John Myers, Senior Analyst from EMA, which stands for Enterprise Management Associates, if you want to look it up. John, yep. welcome to theCUBE. Well, thank you very much, John. It's great to be here. Yeah, so it's great now. So we've got a kind of a different, a different lens on this information. So really, big data is a big term. It's thrown around a lot. I don't know if it's got quite to the hype where the taxi cab drivers in New York are asking about your big data investments. I guess there aren't that many places to play. But from your point of view, kind of what is how do you kind of organize the big data space and where does Splunk okay. fit in and, and how should people really think about this thing when I'm sure that there are, there are CIOs sitting in offices right now going, oh my gosh, you know, I, I need to do something about this big data something. Yep. Where do I go? How do I organize my thoughts? I'm confused. No, no, I, I agree. And I, I think any time that the, uh, the Economist does a, uh, a special insert on a technology, you know it's kind of, I don't know if, it, if you want to call it jump the shark, but it's definitely <laughs> crossed the line of critical mass when you've got the Economist talking about uh, a technology play or uh, a d big data definition. But, you know, uh, we at AMA are, are seeing a lot of, of development in terms of big data. Uh, we've just recently finished up a study. We're currently writing up the result sets. Um, to your point about where do you see organizations going, we see big data being a little bit more about a set of requirements in terms of load, structure, response time, the economics associated with it, then we do say, oh, it's really big data. And we see Splunk fitting in very nicely in terms of being able to acquire the information, analyze from an operational perspective, bring that into, bring that into an area where you can take a look at it. We found one of our big use cases from our survey research is this concept of uh, online archiving of data, because a lot of organizations have tons and tons of data, but before the economics wouldn't allow them to store it for more than, say, three days or X amount of time. That's enough to give you that heartbeat, if you will, on, on your environment, but not enough to say, give me that historical context. I think that Splunk does a great job of being able to flip that over and saying, we're not just looking at the heartbeat of the organization, we're looking at the trends of you know, whatever type of health you're talking about. Is it you know, server performance? Is it you know, data coming through the system? Is it, what are these different pieces? And when you're able to give it that historical context, then you can start projecting out into the future and saying, this is where we can make our capital investment if we're talking strictly about our environment, or we can go, what does that data in those operational systems say about our our business and how do we utilize that as well? So Yeah, for me that's the interesting, really interesting part is when you're taking when you're moving from a strictly IT use case to mm -hmm. Uh, actually affecting business outcomes. And we're seeing yep. that uh, come one of the trends we're seeing here, of course, from among the users are they're often starting with that infrastructure monitoring and management, and now they're moving off to uh, new use cases where they're really solving business problems, not just IT problems. And again, not to uh, downplay the importance of IT, but oh. you know, when you're extending it throughout the organization, it just increases the value of well, your investment. That's one of the great things when you're able to, you know, an IT department that is able to go from heartbeat to strategic value to the organization, that's when they flip their value to the organization. Instead of being a cost center to be dragged back, they're, they're viewed as a strategic asset to be unleashed. Right. Um, you know, I, I come from a telecommunications background, and uh, maybe about three to five years ago, the folks at uh, one of the New York City um, internet providers asked their network team, tell us about this, the health of the network. 
and they said, yeah, everything's green, it's fine, you know, it's working okay. Then somebody said, take customer data and tell us the usage, and they found out that 5% of their user base had 50% of their usage, and they were like, okay, so either someone's running an illegal ISP or we need to revisit our terms and conditions. <laughs> That's something similar. That was a one-time use case. With Splunk here, you can turn that into an ongoing thing. So you can, you can judge your trends. So instead of it being special project to go find out, you can track and trend and see, are we missing revenue opportunities are we, or are we uh, looking at too many costs for, what we're, for our, our service level agreements? For, for when you go into Mahogany Row and you talk to, to, the, to the C guys that aren't down in the mm -hmm. data center, was there an event, was there uh, something loud that kind of got their attention that you know this data is not just IT data that it is actually a lot of strategic value in there that we can do something with I mean was there a use case that's kind well, of popular I, I, kicked I, around or I, you know I what kind when of you, when you think about process? it you know a lot of these organizations have always talked about data our, our data is our strategic asset and at that point, they kind of walked away and said, okay, we, we need to do something else. Uh, but I think we're seeing organizations, uh, I think the poster children are the Facebooks, the LinkedIn's, the et cetera. These are organizations that are built on using their own data as a strategic asset to move themselves forward. So I think that when you saw Amazon being able to do their recommendation engine, and they're using not external data, internal data looking at behaviors. That was kind of the breakthrough. Okay. LinkedIn being able to say, no, it's not just a Rolodex, it's the relationships between the people in the Rolodex, being able to do that. So I think when you had those types of, of, of kind of standard bearers that are moving forward, now the, the key is now for those CIOs that are seeing, hey, how can we, how can we can act like Google? That now the question is, now how do we actually do that? Right. And you need to be able to get the data be able to have it wherever you need it to do the analysis, whether that be from an operational perspective uh, for right now, again, that, that heartbeat, or looking at it in terms of an analytical approach where we're trying to predict and project forward into the future. Mm -hmm. And of course, you've got some organizations, when they, they look at the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, they come to the opposite conclusion and say, well, that's not us, and maybe that oh. doesn't apply to us. That's starting to change, yeah. uh, but you know, we think certainly, there, there really aren't, if you just look at the customers here, there's really no industry that is not impacted by data. Um, so what are you seeing out there in the field among uh, you know, enterprises starting to, starting to get this among the more traditional well, so-called enterprises? Well, th I think, uh, you know, it, I, mean, I don't want to give a shout out to uh, an organization, but if you watch TV, you'll see a, a, a business to consumer insurance organization that says, hey, let's put this little GPS in your car yes, yes. and we'll cut your, we'll, we'll cut your insurance rates. Says, you won't know your name, but it's the cute redhead with the, with exactly. the white outfit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so she doesn't tell you that if you don't pass when you stick the thing in, then maybe they won't be giving you a uh, exactly. policy. Exactly. But you see that there's an example <laughs> of saying, we move from the GPS, which is you know telling us which way to go, to now having a recording device in our automobiles that allows us to do X, Y, and Z. In terms of implementations, I think we're seeing uh, business to business, like big fleet trucking, uh, rental cars, things of that nature, where you have a B2B relationship and you don't have all those, I don't, I don't want to call them, uh, you don't have privacy concerns, but you know, since you have that contractor, you know, owner, employee, contractor, contractor uh, relationship, you don't have them the way you do, say, whenever you talk about cell phone tracking and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. so, I see B2B sensor related data being that kind of that, that, that opening of the floodgate. And as you said, you know, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have thought to use the data from the GPSs to do anything, but now we're linking it to traffic, we're linking it to insurance, we're linking it to driver's behavior. You know, um, and I think one of the big things was to get that adoption into B2C. We ought, they ought you know, that, that insurance company Flow, I, I don't. It. I don't Flow. think. I don't think any that's of us are, are, are really <laughs> excited about. Hey, let me go put this in yeah. my car. But you go. Oh, my 16-year-old. Oh, I'm all over low jacking right, my 16-year-old right, right. and, right. and tracking them. So I think we're seeing a lot of that adoption is going to be from that perspective moving forward, as opposed to other things. But I definitely think B2B is one of the big strong areas from collecting sensor data from logistics, transportation, etc. So now, what about kind of from a uh, 
a competitive standpoint. So, so clearly, say like in the retail space, Walmart was way out ahead of everybody uh -huh. in terms of really being on top of their data and using it as a strategic advantage long before anyone else was talking mm -hmm. about it. Um, so, it, it, does that continue to be a barrier to execute uh, in terms of size and cost and expense, or? or in today's world with today's technologies, you know, as it may be even flip because it's easier to implement as a small player uh, than it is a big because you don't have the barriers you, to implementation. You know, I, I, um, I was just talking with someone here on the show floor. I'm from Boulder, Colorado, where we have a lot of government installations about NOAA and NCAR and things of that nature doing atmospheric research required to create a computer. A government grant, significant, you know, they basically built buildings to hold those computers. Walmart comes down the pike, they have their, they have their, both their, their size, their data set, and their strategic ability to, to analyze that data. You can't set the Wayback Machine to today. There are you know, grad students, actually undergrads at Stanford that have Hadoop clusters in their, their dorm rooms. They're analyzing data in much the same way that you might see a Walmart or another organization go. So I would say that barrier to entry in terms of technology, whether it be from a cost or a processing perspective, we've gone a, a long way from the days of Cray, the days of you know when Walmart was the only one who had all that POS data. Now we're into an area where if you can collect the data, you can put it into a particular place, then you can start to operate on it and it becomes your imagination limiting you, not your the size of your IT or the size of your budget. So. Very interesting. So I wonder if we could talk a little bit about more about Splunk, the company. Okay. Uh, obviously, they've had a, a, they're on a great run, had a very successful IPO in April, uh, just finished up a great quarter. Uh, I think they added about 400 new customers. Uh, what is your take on, uh, why do you think Splunk is hitting kind of such a high note right now? Is there something about the, are they riding the wave of interest around big data, or is it something more in the product and technology that's really crossed a certain point and now it's even more? Well, when you're here in the, uh, on the event floor, and you feel the buzz, the mm -hmm. people here that are excited about, you know, this is a technology, and they're like, oh, this is fantastic. They're, they're people, you know, it's not putting roadblocks in what I'm trying to do, it's enabling what I'm trying to do. So mm -hmm. I think that, that goes right into the quarter, the, the IPO, the et cetera, you know, all those things. And from the case studies that I've worked on, uh, looking at Splunk, you're talking to the customer base that they've got, again, you get this enthusiasm coming back. It's not about the, the limitations. It's about this just opens the doors. And in fact, I think one guy said it just kicks the doors down. Um, and then again, you're into that area where it's like, this is cool. This, I can go and do things. I can be enabled not hold back, reined in going, right. oh, it's going to cost us this. It's going to be like that. You know, um, everything I've heard from both here on the floor and in the, the people I've talked with in terms of customer base, Splunk just enables them to do the things that they need to do as opposed to being that inhibiting force. So. Which is the complete opposite of what we've been, what you hear normally over the years uh, from uh, yeah, again. enterprise software vendors who I won't name. But. <laughs> yeah, again, I, I come from a, a telecom background and you know, you start talking big data and data warehousing from that perspective and you get people going, oh, okay, all right, yeah. You, you got to realize that data warehouses were, built, were, were designed for telecommunications organizations and they did such a wonderful job at it that they don't, you know, nobody uses the ones at telecoms or they have very bad reputations, let me put it that way. Um, but, you know, when you've got a technology that says, let's not stop you, let's make you go faster. Mm -hmm. Let's not try to say, You've got to do it our way. They're saying, no, let's open the possibilities, let's see how it can work. Uh, and then I think the, the people at Splunk have done a great job with an adoption path that's not huge barrier to get in. You can get in the way you want to get in and then start building up. You know, we're seeing a lot of organizations with that kind of disruptive land and expand type of methodology. Um, and then you're definitely sensing that energy here where you, know, you can get in, start building up that uh, that critical mass and then really break out. So, so yeah, so how, how, is, how are technologies like Splunk, other big data technologies, kind of disrupting the traditional BI and data warehousing world? We've seen, you mentioned, I mean, the old data, data warehousing paradigm was you take 18 months, two years to <laughs> model all your data, get it all in there, make this pristine uh, data temple, as my boss uh, Dave Vellante at Wikibon says, and then if you have any changes you want to make to it, you got to go through the two-year process again or you just don't do it, it's not yep. worth the time and effort. 
and in the end you've got this very expensive project that sometimes doesn't even get finished. Well, I think that's one of the things that links both big data to the disruptive technologies. We're looking at, you know, in the example you just put out, you set the structure at the front gate, and if you can't meet the structure, you can't get in the front gate. And that made a lot of sense back then. Um, now, we've got the ability to set that structure farther and farther back into the process because we now have the power to process through it faster that you could say, okay, let everybody in the gates mm -hmm. and then, or all the data in the gates and then when we get closer to decision time, then we can start to apply a structure to it or a schema right. or whatever you'd like to talk about it. And I think that's where big data really, you know, again, that's where people are getting excited about this concept of big data. Everyone calls it unstructured. I once heard somebody say, well, unless it's a, a file with randomly generated bits, it's not unstructured. There's some structure to it. But when you have these multi-structured uh, environments, you're bringing data in, and you kind of decide, let me bring it all in, and then decide what I'm going to do with it. The processing power, the, the, the uh, cost, the economics, if you will, of the uh, platforms really enable that so that you can make that decision far closer and closer, you know, that, that, that structure point closer and closer to the decision point. Mm -hmm. I think Splunk does a great job of enabling people to do that type of stuff where they're not forced to say, make that decision here and wait two years. Uh, we have a, uh, a number we like to quote at EMA is that most data warehouses are uh, 2, 2, and 50. $2 million, two years to implement, 50% of them fail. <laughs> so, you know, when you start flipping that around and saying, mm -hmm. how can we get be up and running in four to six weeks or three months in terms of returning uh, positive uh, revenue or positive investment uh, ROI numbers to the organization, that's where people are going to see it. And when you get to have that speed, that speed to implementation, that time to value, that gets the attention of the CFO, the CFO then goes, I think this project needs some more money, as opposed to this one that's two years and doesn't need more money. Right, but. Right. So how do you see the, you know, those data warehousing vendors, the Teradata's and Oracle's of the world, adapting in this new landscape? Uh, well, do you see I, some doing better than others? I think that, there are a lot, that there's a lot to, to offer still in that <laughs> traditional EDW. So, you know, I've got good friends at Oracle, uh, Teradata, IBM, the whole nine yards. <laughs> um, but they offer a lot of great opportunities to do things. Yeah, when you need to do counts, sums, et cetera, they offer a great opportunity because they are built upon a structured data environment, et cetera. When you go to an unstructured environment, when you have to do something like a semantic analytic or you don't know what you don't know. I always, mm -hmm. I, I, I love the, I always love the quote, you know, the things you know, the things you know you don't know, then the things you don't know you don't know, Big data sits in that, the things right. you don't know, you right. don't know. Splunk right. is right there so that you mm -hmm. can decide, instead of having that three-day win three window of data, have a, a billing cycle, have a whole year worth of data at your mm -hmm. availability. The data warehouses are still great about, let's see what we know about the, the things we know and how do we churn through data associated with that. Mm -hmm. If you have a, a, a different type of problem, then they don't so, do so great, and that's where you get complementary systems mm -hmm. that allow you to have the best of both worlds. So. Yeah, I, I agree. I think they are certainly complementary now, but I think some of the, you know, the larger players in that old mm -hmm. world are going to have to adapt because oh, yes. as we're seeing, these, these big data platforms are adding more and more capabilities and getting easier and easier to use, mm -hmm. and before too long, they're going to be able to do a lot of the more traditional type of things that you think of in an enterprise data warehouse, and that's going to leave some people, some vendors, in a position where, well, if they don't adapt, you know, I'm not saying Oracle's going out of business anytime soon. <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to say that. <laughs> but, you know, I feel like, especially Oracle, they've got, they're really threatened, I think, by this movement because it kind of goes contrary to the way they, uh, their whole business model, the kind of scale yeah. up and uh, no, one I, big machine. And you, 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 you make an excellent point, and I think a lot of the, the big traditional players, as long as they stick to that apply the schema at the beginning, as, as, when they can start to pull that application of schema farther back. Right that's when they're going to be successful. They, if they maintain the wall at the edge, people are going to move around them and go in different directions. I still think they provide great value in terms of the things that they do, but the, when they can apply that schema later on and provide that value, you know, rather than say no, 